So Graham Greene's The Destructors. It was on the eve of August bank holiday that the latest recruit became the leader of the Wormsley Common Gang. No one was surprised except Mike, but Mike at the age of nine was surprised by everything. If you don't shut your mouth, somebody once said to him, you'll get a frog down it. After that, Mike kept his teeth tightly clamped except when the surprise was too great. The new recruit had been with the gang since the beginning of the summer holidays and there were new possibilities about his brooding silence that all recognized. He never wasted a word, even to tell his name, until that was required of him by the rules. When he said Trevor, it was a statement of fact, not as it would have been with the others, a statement of shame or defiance. Nor did anyone laugh except Mike, who, finding himself without support and meeting the dark gaze of the newcomer, opened his mouth and was quiet again. There was every reason why T, as he was afterwards referred to, should have been an object of mockery. There was his name, and they substituted the initial because otherwise they had no excuse not to laugh at it. The fact that his father, a former architect and present clerk, had come down in the world, and that his mother considered herself better than the neighbors. What but an odd quality of danger, of the unpredictable, established him in the gang without any ignoble ceremony of initiation? The gang met every morning in an impromptu car park, the site of the last bomb of the first Blitz. The Blitz is the bombing of London by the Nazi Luftwaffe in World War II. The leader, who was known as Blackie, claimed to have heard it fall and no one was precise enough in his dates to point out that he would have been one year old and fast asleep on the down platform of Wormsley Common Underground Station. It's the subway. That's where you hid when the bombs were falling in London and you couldn't escape. On one side of the car park lent the first occupied house, number three of the shattered Northwood Terrace, literally lent, for it had suffered from the blast of the bomb and the sidewalls were supported on wooden struts. A smaller bomb and incendiaries had fallen beyond so that the house stuck up, stuck up like a jagged tooth and carried on the further wall relics of its neighbor, a dado, the remains of a fireplace. T, whose words were almost confined to voting yes or no to the plan of operations proposed each day by Blackie, once startled the whole gang by saying broodingly, Wren built that house, father says. Who's Wren? The man who built St. Paul's. Who cares, Blackie said. It's only old miseries. By the way, St. Paul's is St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the most famous cathedrals in the world. It did, of course, survive the Blitz. Wren is Christopher Wren, perhaps the most famous architect uh, in, in English history. Old Misery, whose real name was Thomas, had once been a builder and a decorator. He lived alone in the crippled house, doing for himself once a week. You could see him coming across the common with bread and vegetables. And once, as the boys played in the car park, he put his head over the smashed wall of his garden and looked at them. Been to the lab, one of the boys said. For it was common knowledge that since the bombs fell, something had gone wrong with the pipes of his house. An old misery was too mean to spend money on the property. He could do the redecorating himself at cost price, but he had never learnt plumbing. The lav was a wooden shed at the bottom of the narrow garden with a star-shaped hole in the door. It had escaped the blast, which had smashed the house next door and sucked out the window frames of number three. The next time the game became aware of Mr. Thomas was more surprising. Blackie, Mike, and a thin yellow boy, who for some reason was called by his surname Summers, met him on the common coming back from the market. Mr. Thomas stopped them. He said glumly, You belong to that lot that play in the car park. Mike was about to answer when Blackie stopped him. As the leader, he had responsibilities. Suppose we are, he said, ambiguously. I got some chocolates, Mr. Thomas said. Don't like them myself. Here you are. Not enough to go around, I don't suppose. There never is, he added with somber conviction. He handed over three packets of Smarties. The gang was puzzled and perturbed by this action and tried to explain it away. Bet someone dropped them and he picked them up, somebody suggested. Pinched them and then got in a bleeding funk, another thought aloud. It's a bribe, Summers said. He wants us to stop bouncing balls on his wall. We'll show him we don't take bribes. Blackie said, and they sacrificed the whole morning to the game of bouncing that only Mike was young enough to enjoy. There was no sign from Mr. Thomas. 
Next day, T astonished them all. He was late at the rendezvous, and the voting for that day's exploit took place without him. At Blackie's suggestion, the gang was to disperse in pairs, take buses at random, and see how many free rides could be snatched from unwary conductors. The operation was to be carried out in pairs to avoid cheating. They were drawing lots for their companions when T arrived. Where have you been, T? Blackie asked. You can't vote now. You know the rules. I've been there, T said. He looked at the ground as though he had thoughts to hide. Where? At old miseries. Mike's mouth opened and then hurriedly closed again with a click. He had remembered the frog. At old miseries? Mike's mouth, oh, oh, excuse me. At old miseries, Blackie said. There was nothing in the rules against it, but he had a sensation that T was treading on dangerous ground. He asked hopefully, did you break in? No, I rang the bell. And what did you say? I said I wanted to see his house. What did he do? He showed it to me. Pinch anything? No. What did you do it for, then? The gang had gathered round. It was as though an impromptu court were about to form and try some case of deviation. T said, it's a beautiful house. And still watching the ground, meeting no one's eyes, he licked his lips first one way, then the other. What do you mean, a beautiful house? Blackie asked with scorn. It's got a staircase 200 years old, like a corkscrew. Nothing holds it up. What do you mean, nothing holds it up? Does it float? It's to do with opposite forces, old misery said. What else? There's a paneling, like in the blue boar? 200 years old. Is old misery 200 years old? Mike laughed suddenly and then was quiet again. The meeting was in a serious mood. For the first time since T had strolled into the car park on the first day of the holidays, his position was in danger. It only needed a single use of his real name and the gang would be at his heels. What did you do it for? Blackie asked. He was just... He had no jealousy. He was anxious to retain T in the gang if he could. It was the word beautiful that worried him. That belonged to a class world that you could still see parodied at the Wormsley Common Empire by a man wearing a top hat and a monocle with a haw-haw accent. He was tempted to say, my dear Trevor, old chap, and unleash his hellhounds. If you'd broken in, he said sadly, that indeed would have been an exploit worthy of the gang. This was better, T said. I found out things. He continued to stare at his feet, not meeting anybody's eye, as though he were absorbed in some dream he was unwilling or ashamed to share. What things? Old Misery's going to be away all tomorrow and bank holiday, Blackie said with relief. You mean we could break in and pinch things, somebody asked. Blackie said, nobody's going to pinch things. Breaking in, that's good enough, isn't it? We don't want to eat court stuff. I don't want to pinch anything, T said. I've got a better idea. What is it? T raised eyes as gray and disturbed as the drab August day. We'll pull it down, he said. We'll destroy it. Blackie gave a single hoot of laughter, and then, like Mike, fell quiet, daunted by the serious, implacable gaze. Would the police be doing all that time? he asked. They'd never know. We do it from inside. I've found a way in, he said with a sort of intensity. We'd be like worms, don't you see? In an apple. When we came out again, there'd be nothing there. No staircase, no panels, nothing but just walls. And then we'd make the walls fall down. Somehow. We'd go to Jug, Blackie said. It was to prove. And anyway, we wouldn't have pinched anything, he added without the smallest flicker of glee. There wouldn't be anything to pinch after we'd finished. I've never heard of going to prison for breaking things, Summers said. There wouldn't be time, Blackie said. I've seen housebreakers at work. There are twelve of us, T said. We'd organize. None of us know how... I know, T said. He looked across at Blackie. Have you got a better plan? Today, Mike said tactlessly, we're pinching free rides. Free rides, T said. Kid stuff. You can stand down, Blackie, if you'd rather. The gang's got to vote. Put it up, then, Blackie said uneasily. It's proposed that tomorrow and Monday we destroy old Misery's house. Hear, hear, said a fat boy called Joe. Who's in favor? T said it's carried. How do we start? Summers asked. He'll tell you, Blackie said. It was the end of his leadership.
He went away to the back of the car park and began to kick a stone, dribbling it this way and that. There was only one old Morris in the park, for a few cars were there except lorries. It's like a truck. Without an attendant, there was no safety. He took a flying kick at the car and scraped a little paint off the rear mudguard. Beyond paying no more attention to him than to a stranger, the gang had gathered around tea. Blackie was dimly aware of the fickleness of favor. He thought of going home, of never returning, of letting them all discover the hollowness of T's leadership. But suppose, after all, what T proposed was possible. Nothing like it had been done before. The fame of the Wormsley Common Car Park gang would surely reach London. There would be headlines in the papers. Even the grown-up gangs who ran the betting and an all-wrestling and the barrel boys would hear with respect of how old Misery's house had been destroyed, driven by the pure, simple, and altruistic ambition of fame for the gang. Blackie came to where T stood in the shadow of old Misery's wall. T was giving his orders with decision. It was as though the plan had been with him all his life, pondered through the seasons, and now, in his fifteenth year, crystallized with the pain of puberty. You, he said to Mike, bring some big nails, the biggest you can find, and a hammer. Anybody who can better bring a hammer and a screwdriver. We'll need plenty of them. Chisels, too. We can't have too many chisels. Can anybody bring a saw? I can, Mike said. Not a child's saw, T said. A real saw. Blackie realized he had raised his hand like any ordinary member of the gang. Right, you bring one, Blackie. But now there's a difficulty. We want a hacksaw. What's a hacksaw? Someone asked. You can get him at Woolworth's, Summers said. The fat boy called Joe said gloomily, I knew it would end in a collection. I'll get one myself, T said. I don't want your money. I can't buy a sledgehammer, though. Blackie said, they are working at number 15. I know where they'll leave their stuff for the bank holiday. Then that's it, T said. We'll meet here at nine sharp. I've got to go to church, Mike said. Come over the wall and whistle. We'll let you in. Two. On Sunday morning, all were punctual except Blackie, even Mike. Mike had a stroke of luck. His mother fell ill, and his father was too tired after Saturday night, and he was told to go to church alone with many warnings of what would happen if he strayed. Blackie had difficulty in smuggling out the saw, and then in finding the sledgehammer at the back of number 15. He approached the house from a lane at the rear of the garden, for fear of the policeman's beat along the main road. The tired evergreens kept off a stormy sun. Another wet bank holiday was being prepared over the Atlantic, beginning in swirls of dust under the trees. Blackie climbed the wall into Misery's garden. There was no sign of anybody anywhere. The laugh stood like a tomb in a neglected graveyard. The curtains were drawn. The house slept. Blackie lumbered near with the saw and the sledgehammer. Perhaps, after all, nobody had turned up. The plan had been a wild invention. They had woken wiser. But when he came to the back door, he could hear a confusion of sound hardly louder than a hive in a swarm, a clickety-clack, a bang-bang, a scraping, a creaking, a sudden painful crack. He thought, it's true, and whistled. They opened the back door to him, and he came in. He had at once the impression of organization, very different from the happy old go-lucky ways under his leadership. For a while, he wandered up and down the stairs looking for tea. Nobody addressed him. He had a sense of great urgency, and already he began to see the plan. The interior of the house was being carefully demolished without touching the walls. Summers, with hammer and chisel, was ripping out the skirting boards in the ground floor dining room. He had already smashed the panels of the door. In the same room, Joe was heaving up the parquet blocks, exposing the soft wood floorboards over the cellar. Coils of wire came out of the damaged skirting, and Mike sat happily on the floor, clipping the wires. On the curved stairs, two of the gang were working hard with an inadequate child saw on the banisters. When they saw Blackie's big saw, they signaled for it wordlessly. When he next saw them, a quarter of the banisters had been dropped into the hall. He found tea at last in the bathroom. He sat moodily in the least cared-for room in the house, listening to the sounds coming up from below. You've really done it, Blackie said with awe. What's going to happen? We've only just begun, T said. He looked at the sledgehammer and gave his instructions. You stay here and break the bath in the wash basin. Don't bother about the pipes. They'll come later. Mike peered at the door. I finished the wires, T, he said. Good. You've just got to go wandering round now. The kitchen's in the basement. Smash all the china and glass and bottles you can lay a hold of. Don't turn on the taps. We don't want to flood. Yet. Then go into all the rooms and turn out the drawers. If they are locked, get one of the others to break them open. 
Tear up any papers you find and smash all the ornaments. Better take a carving knife with you from the kitchen. The bedroom is opposite here. Open the pillows. Tear up the sheets. That's enough for the moment. And you, Blackie, when you've finished in here, crack the plaster in the passage up with your sledgehammer. What are you going to do? Blackie asked. I'm looking for something special, T said. It was nearly lunchtime before Blackie had finished and went in search of tea. Chaos had advanced. The kitchen was a shambles of broken glass and china. The dining room was stripped of parquet. The skirting was up. The doors had been taken off their hinges, and the destroyers had moved up a floor. Streaks of light came in through the closed shutters where they worked with the seriousness of creators. And destruction, after all, is a form of creation. A kind of imagination had seen this house as it had now become. Mike said, I've got to go home for dinner. Who else? T asked. But all the others, on one excuse or another, had brought provisions with them. They squatted in the ruins of the room and swapped unwanted sandwiches. Half an hour for lunch, and they were at work again. By the time Mike returned, they were on the top floor, and by six the superficial damage was completed. The doors were all off, all the skirtings raised, the furniture pillaged and ripped and smashed. No one could have slept in this house except on a broken bed of plaster. D gave his orders, eight o'clock next morning, and to escape notice they climbed singly over the garden wall into the car park. Only Blackie and T were left. The light had nearly gone, and when they touched a switch, nothing worked. Mike had done his job thoroughly. Did you find anything special? Blackie asked. T nodded. Come over here, he said, and look. Out of both pockets, he drew bundles of pound notes. Old misery's savings, he said. Mike ripped out the mattress, but he missed them. What are you going to do, share them? We aren't thieves, T said. Nobody's going to steal anything from this house. I kept these for you and me, a celebration. He knelt down on the floor and counted them out. There were seventy in all. We'll burn them, he said, one by one. And taking it in turns, they held the note upwards and lit the top corner so that the flame burnt slowly toward their fingers. The gray ash floated above them and fell on their heads like age. I'd like to see old Misery's face when we are through, T said. You hate him a lot, Blackie asked. Of course I don't hate him. T said, there'd be no fun if I hated him. The last burning note illuminated his brooding face. All this hate and love, he said, it's soft, it's hooey. There's only things, Blackie. And he looked around the room, crowded with the unfamiliar shadows of half things, broken things, formal things. I'll race you home, Blackie, he said. Three. Next morning, the serious destruction started. Two were missing. Mike and another boy whose parents were off to South End and Brighton, in spite of the slow warm drops, had begun in the fall, and the rumble of the thumber, thunder in the estuary, like the first guns of the old blitz. We gotta hurry, T said. Summers was restive. Haven't we done enough? To, uh, he asked. I've been given a bob for slot machines. This is like work. We've hardly started, T said. Why, there's all the floors left, and the stairs. We haven't taken out a single window. You voted like the others. We are going to destroy this house. There won't be anything left when we've finished. They began again on the first floor, picking up the top floorboards next to the outer wall, leaving the joists exposed. And they saw through the joists and retreated into the hall as what was left of the floor healed and sank. They had learnt with practice, and the second floor collapsed more easily. By the evening, an odd exhilaration seized them as they looked down the great hollow of the house. They ran risks and made mistakes. When they thought of the windows, it was too late to reach them. Corjo said and dropped a penny down into the dry, rubble-filled well. It cracked and span amongst the broken glass. Why did we start this? Summers asked with astonishment. T was already on the ground, digging at the rubble, clearing a space along the outer wall. Turn on the taps, he said. It's too dark for anyone to see now, and in the morning, it won't matter. The water overtook them on the stairs and fell through the floorless rooms. It was then that they heard Mike whistle at the back. Something's wrong, Blackie said. They could hear his urgent breathing as they unlocked the door. The boogies? Summers asked. Old misery, Mike said. He's on his way, he said with pride. But why? T said. He told me. He protested with the fury of the child. He had never been. 
It isn't fair. He was down at South End, Mike said, and he was on the train coming back, said it was too cold and wet. He paused and gazed at the water. My, you've had a storm here. Is the roof leaking? How long will he be? Five minutes. I gave him the slip and ran. We better clear, Summer said. We've done enough anyway. Oh, no, we haven't. Anybody could do this. This was the shattered, hollowed house with nothing left but the walls. Yet walls could be preserved. Facades were valuable. They could build inside again more beautifully than before. This could be a home again, he said angrily. We've got to finish. Don't move. Let me think. There's no time, a boy said. There's got to be a way, T said. We couldn't have got this far. We've done a lot, Blackie said. No, no, we haven't. Somebody watch the front. We can't do any more. He may come in at the back. Watch the back, too, T began to plead. Just give me a minute and I'll fix it up. I, I swear I'll fix it. But his authority had gone with his ambiguity. He was only one of the gang. Please, he said. Please, Summers mimicked him and then suddenly struck home with the fatal name. Wrong along home, Trevor. T stood with his back to the rubber like a boxer knocked groggy against the ropes. He had no words as his dreams shook and slid. Then Blackie acted before the gang had time to laugh, pushing Summers backward. I'll watch the front T, he said, and cautiously he opened the shutters of the hall. The gray wet common stretched ahead and the lamps gleamed in the puddles. Someone's coming, T. No, it's not him. What's your plan, T? Tell Mike to go out into the lab and hide close beside it. When he hears me whistle, he's got to count to ten and start to shout. Shout what? Oh, help. Anything. You hear, Mike? Blackie said. He was the leader again. He took a quick look between the shutters. He's coming, T. Quick. Mike, the lab. Stay here. Blackie, all of you. Till I yell. Where are you going, T? Don't worry. I'll see to this. I said I would, didn't I? Old Misery came limping off the common. He had mud on his shoes, and he stopped to scrape them on the pavement's edge. He didn't want to soil his house, which stood jagged and dark between the bomb sites, saved so narrowly as he believed from destruction. Even the fanlight had been left unbroken by the bomb's blast. Somewhere, somebody whistled. Old Misery looked sharply round. He didn't trust whistles. A child was shouting. It seemed to come from his own garden. Then a boy ran into the road from the car park. Mr. Thomas, he called. Mr. Thomas, what is it? I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Thomas. One of us has got taken short, and we thought you wouldn't mind, and now he can't get out. What do you mean, boy? He's got stuck in your lab. He'd no business. Haven't I seen you before? You showed me your house. So I did, so I did. That doesn't give you the right to... Do hurry, Mr. Thomas. He'll suffocate. Nonsense. He can't suffocate. Wait till I put my bag in. I'll carry your bag. Oh, no, you don't. I carry my own. This, this way, Mr. Thomas. I can't get in the garden that way. I've got to go through the house. But you can get in the garden this way, Mr. Thomas. We often do. You often do? He followed the boy with a scandalized fascination. When? Now, what right? Do you see? The wall's low. I'm not going to climb walls into my own garden. It's absurd. This is how we do it. One foot here, one foot there, and over. The boy's face peered down, an arm shot out, and Mr. Thomas found his bag taken and deposited on the other side of the wall. Give me my bag back, Mr. Thomas said. From the loo, a boy yelled and yelled. I'll call the police. Your bag's all right, Mr. Thomas. Look, one foot there, on your right, now just above, to your left. Mr. Thomas climbed over his own garden wall. Here's your bag, Mr. Thomas. I'll have the wall built up, Mr. Thomas said. I'll not have you boys coming over here and using my loo. He stumbled on the path, but the boy caught his elbow and supported him. Thank you, thank you, my boy, he murmured automatically. Somebody shouted again through the dark. I'm coming, I'm coming, Mr. Thomas called. He said to the boy beside him, now, I'm not unreasonable been a boy myself, as long as things are done regular. I don't mind you playing around the place Saturday mornings. Sometimes I like the company. Only it's got to be regular. One of you asks leave, and I say yes. Sometimes I say, I'll say no, I won't feel like it. And you come in at the front door and out of the back. No garden walls. Do get him out, Mr. Thomas. He won't come to any harm in my loo, Mr. Thomas said, stumbling slowly down the garden. Oh, my rheumatics, he said. Always get them on bank holiday. I've got to be careful. There's loose stones here. Give me your hand. 
Do you know what my horoscope said yesterday? Abstain from any dealings in first half of week. Danger of serious crash. That might be on this path, Mr. Thomas said. They speak in parables and double meanings. He paused at the door of his loo. What's the matter in there, he called. There was no reply. Perhaps he's fainted, the boy said. Not in my loo. Here, you come out, Mr. Thomas said, and giving a great jerk at the door, he nearly fell out of his, on his back when it swung so easily open. A hand first supported him and then pushed him hard. His head hit the opposite wall, and he sat down heavily. His bag hit his feet. A hand whipped the key out of the lock, and the door slammed. Let me out, he called, and heard the key turn in the lock. A serious crash, he thought, and felt ditherly confused and old. Mr. Thomas put his head between his hands and pondered. He had noticed that there was only one lorry in the car park, and he felt certain that the driver would not come before it in the morning. Nobody could hear him from the road in front, and the lane at the back was seldom used. Anyone who passed there would be hurrying home and would not pause for what they would certainly take to be drunken cries. And if he did call help, who, on a lonely bank holiday evening, would have the courage to investigate? Mr. Thomas sat at the loo and pondered with the wisdom of age. After a while, it seemed to him that there were sounds in the silence. They were faint and came from the direction of his house. He stood up and peered through the ventilation hole. Between the cracks and one of the shutters, he saw a light. Not the light of a lamp, but the wavering light that a candle might give. Then he thought he heard the sound of hammering and scraping and chipping. He thought of burglars. Perhaps they had employed the boy as a scout. But why should burglars engage in what sounded more and more like a stealthily form of carpentry? Mr. Thomas let out an experimental yell, but nobody answered. The noise could not even have reached his enemies. Four. Mike had gone home to bed, but the rest stayed. The question of leadership no longer concerned the gang. With nails, chisels, screwdrivers, and anything that was sharp and penetrating, they moved around the inner walls, worrying at the mortar between the bricks. They started too high, and it was Blackie who hit on the damp course and realized the work could be halved if they weakened the joists immediately above. It was a long, tiring, unamusing job, but at last, it was finished. The gutted house stood there balanced on a few inches of mortar between the clamp course and the bricks. There remained the most dangerous task of all, out in the open at the edge of the bomb site. Summers was sent to watch the road for passers-by, and Mr. Thomas, sitting on the loo, heard clearly now the sound of sawing. It no longer came from the house, and that a little reassured him. He felt less concerned. Perhaps the other noises, too, had no significance. A voice spoke to him through the hole. Mr. Thomas, let me out, Mr. Thomas said sternly. Here's a blanket, the voice said, and a long gray sausage was worked through the hole and fell in swaths over Mr. Thomas's head. There's nothing personal, the voice said. We want you to be comfortable tonight. Tonight? Mr. Thomas repeated incredulously. Catch, the voice said. Penny buns. We've buttered them and sausage rolls. We don't want you to starve, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas pleaded desperately. A joke's a joke, boy. Let me out and I won't say a thing. I've got rheumatics. I've got to sleep comfortable. You wouldn't be comfortable. Not in your house, you wouldn't. Not now. What do you mean, boy? But the footsteps receded. There was only the silence of night. No sound of sawing. Mr. Thomas tried one more yell, but he was daunted and rebuked by the silence. A long way off, an owl hooted and made away again in its muffled flight through the soundless world. At seven next morning, the driver came to fetch his lorry. He climbed into the seat and started the engine. He was vaguely aware of a voice shouting, but it didn't concern him. At last, the engine responded, and he backed the lorry out until it touched the great wooden shore that supported Mr. Thomas's house. That way, he could drive right out and down the street without reversing. The lorry moved forward, was momentarily checked as though something were pulling it from behind, and then went on to the sound of a long, rumbling crash. The driver was astonished to see bricks bouncing ahead of him while stones hit the roof of his cab. He put on his brakes. When he climbed out, the whole landscape had suddenly been altered. There was no house beside the car park, only a hill of rubble. He went round and examined the back of his lorry for damage and found a rope tied there that was still twisted at the other end round part of a wooden strut. The driver again became aware of somebody shouting. It came from the wooden erection, which was the nearest thing to a house in that desolation of broken brick. The driver climbed the smashed wall and unlocked the door. Mr. Thomas came out of the loo. 
He was wearing a gray blanket to which flakes of pastry adhered. He gave a sobbing cry. My house, he said. Where's my house? Search me, the driver said. His eye lit on the remains of a bath and what had once been a dresser, and he began to laugh. There wasn't anything left anywhere. How dare you laugh, Mr. Thomas said. It was my house, my house. I'm sorry, the driver said, making heroic efforts. But when he remembered the sudden check of his lorry, the crash of bricks falling, he became convulsed again. One moment, the house had stood there with such dignity between the bomb sites like a man in a top hat. And then, bang, crash. There wasn't anything left, not anything. He said, I'm sorry, I, I can't help, Mr. Thomas. There's nothing personal. But you got to admit, it's funny.